This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. So welcome to another session of uh, Anti-Capitalist Chronicles. Uh, Today I'm going to take up a a rather grand theme, but do it through some uh, very particular circumstances. Uh, The grand theme has been stirred by some pre-publicity of a book that is supposed to come out very shortly uh, by somebody called Brad DeLong, and the book is called uh, Slouching to Utopia. I have not read it, and I haven't had the opportunity to read it because it doesn't come out officially till September, But uh, Paul Krugman has uh, read it, and so has Larry Summers, and both of them are sort of doing the kind of pre-publication publicity that would seem to say that this is a book which uh, is going to be a bit like Piketty or whatever, uh, that uh, it's going to be, uh, if you like, uh, the bourgeois account uh, of the world. Now, I'm, I find it interesting for, for two reasons, that uh, the sketch of the account, which I get from Krugman and Summers, goes something like this, that uh, for nearly all of its history, humanity has been locked into what might be called a, a Malthusian trap, that uh, any increase in productivity uh, is immediately taken up by population increase Uh, the result of which is that uh, humanity has always been basically living at a sustainable kind of living standard, just about, or a real subsistence levels standard, if not uh, impoverishment, and that therefore uh, the possibility of humanity emerging from this situation of living at a uh, substantially low level of uh, of income and welfare and well-being. Uh, the possibility of doing something rather than that is uh, rather rare, and it uh, indicates certain phases of uh, capitalist history where the Malthusian trap uh, has not ex- has not uh, uh, worked and where there have been real advances in terms of human well-being and uh, human uh, capacity, and that those two phases of, of this are really dated from the late 19th century, from about 1870 to 1914. Then there was the war and the Second World War. And then came another period known as the 30 glorious years, or the French call it les 30 ans, uh, glorieux, where uh, somehow or other social democracy, technological change got together to create a rather radical uh, transformation. And the sort of thing you look at would be to say, well, um, you know, back in, say, the late 18th century, or even beginning of the 19th century, if you looked at the, those areas where capital was well established, which was mainly Britain, Western Europe, and the eastern seaboard of the United States, if you looked at those areas, you would see that about the top 10% of the population had a great deal of wealth accumulated during these, this period. But the mass of the population, the other 90%, Uh, basically lived at subsistence level. Uh, They lived close to the poverty line, uh, could not escape the poverty line. And what happened, however, from about 1850 to 1910 uh, and from uh, 1945 to 1975 was that, of course, the top 10% maintained its position, but then added to it of another 40%, if you like, of a middle class which is quite well well established, uh, had an adequate living standard, and and you could kind of say that humanity had escaped, at least for 50% of the population, the Malthusian trap. Uh, The Malthusian uh, side of things was still there, uh, but it applied only now to the bottom 10% of the population very rigorously, and bottom 50% of the population in a, in a very general kind of sense. So the, the, this is, the, this is the, 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 the argument which is apparently made in the book by uh, Brad uh, DeLong. And the two big questions which are posed are, first, why did then how did this happen? Uh, 
And so there's apparently an account of this, um, which uh, I suspect I would be very critical of because it's one of those accounts which is looking for a single bullet or a, two single bullets or whatever it is, which is going to actually account for everything. Uh, when it seems to me, I would always want to be talking about the evolution of the totality. But the second thing, which I really want to spend some time on, is the fact that these phases of good development, of strong development, of positive development, and of, of the improvement of living standards, of actually probably at least half of the world's population, if not more, these uh, features did not correspond uh, to an, an increasing sense of happiness, of uh, what Paul Krogman calls felicity. Felicity didn't go with, with, with all of this, that therefore we are now in a situation which is relevant to us where we have to look at a situation where the mass of the world is not thinking of things in a very positive light and we're surrounded by a lot of very negative signs. For example, uh, the, 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 the shootings at the, uh, at, at the July 4th uh, parade in Illinois, uh, the shootings at the schools, uh, the mass shootings in the United States, those sorts of things suggest that there's something going on which is not very, you know, which is not very felicitous at all. Uh, the rise of uh, these peculiar conspiracy theories, uh, the return of a, a lot of uh, right-wing extremism and, and things of that kind would, would suggest that we are in a very, very unsettled condition right now, uh, even in the face of all of the technological changes which have actually given us the possibility to live a different life, but we're not actually enjoying that different life. So that, that, that is the, 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 uh, the theme of the book, as I ga gather it from uh, readings of Summer's account of it and, 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 and Krugman's account of it. But here is where uh, I have another interest in Brad DeLong, because back in 2008, 2009, I wrote uh, an interpretation of what was going on in terms of the fiscal crisis uh, and the financial crisis of those years. Uh, and uh, I wrote a piece about why the, why the stimulus was, uh, was bound to fail. And it, it got taken up many, many places, quite a, quite a lot of feedback on it. And, and, and quite a lot of, of commentary on it. And it elicited a particular commentary by Brad DeLong. And he was particularly rude about what it was I was doing. So to, to understand what I was doing, I was actually intrigued with the idea that the financial crisis, which was kind of when it begins to be felt towards the end of the 1990s and which culminates in 2007, 2008, was a sign of something which uh, was very appealing to me to think about which comes from the reading of, uh, or rather comes from the reading of, of, of Ferdinand Brodel, the economic historian by the economic sociologist Giovanni Arrighi. And, and Arrighi kind of wrote a book really talking about the shifting hegemony within the, the global world system. And what he basically documented was the way in which uh, capital initially, uh, particularly merchant capital and, and, and finance to some degree, really took off in the Italian city-states uh, in the 14th, 15th uh, centuries. And that this uh, was, if you like, the original heart of uh, the political economy of what capitalism was about. And it had its tentacles stretched outside through the merchant system and the like, through the uh, through the, uh, uh, the elastic system that developed trade across all of Europe uh, to Europe and so on. And, and, and we start to see a shift in hegemony from the Italian city-states to the low countries, to, to Belgium and, and, and Holland, and in particular to Amsterdam. And Amsterdam became, if you like, the, the, the capital of, of global capitalism uh, because of the, the activities of the merchants and the trading empire that the, the Dutch set up. But that lasted till the end of the 18th century when Britain started to take over and became more, more hegemonic. And and then and then Britain, if you like, came to dominate global capitalism, being the leading political economic power, calling the shots around the world, militarily and, and economically, and all the rest of it. And doing that up until around 1914, uh, and at that point, the United States started to step into the role of becoming becoming the the world hege hegemon. 
And particularly after 1945, there was no question as to who was the top dog within the capitalist world, leaving outside, of course, the, the, the communist world. And, the, and that top dog was the United, United States. Uh, but uh, from about the late 1980s through to 2008, uh, there started to be some challenges to U.S. hegemony. And one of the things that Giovanni Rigi concentrated on was a phrase from Braudel, which kind of says, the end of a hegemony is signaled by a strong phase of financialization. And what Rigi did in his book was to look at the strong phase of financialization that allowed the transfer of hegemonic power from the low countries to, to Amsterdam, uh, the transfer of financial power from Amsterdam to London, uh, and then the transfer of financial power from London to, to New York. So, so if a phase of financialization precedes a shifting hegemonic structure, it seemed to me that it might be important to look at 2007, 2008 and the financial problems that had led up to it, which included the East Asian financial crisis, uh, the bankruptcy of Russia and the bankruptcy of Argentina and places like that leading into uh, the, the financial crisis of 2001, which, which then was briefly overcome by very loose monetary policy and ultimately culminating in 2007, 2008. So in 2008, I kind of said, well, is this, is this a sign of a shifting hegemonic condition? And if it is a sign of a shifting hegemonic tradition, where's the, where's the new hegemon likely to be? And it's obviously it would likely to be in East Asia, uh, particularly concentrated with the rise of China. And therefore we had to deal with and look very closely at what, uh, what was going on in terms of the financial crisis and what its relationship was to the radical transformation in the Chinese economy and the radical growth of the Chinese economy to the point where uh, by the time we get to sort of 2020, China is almost as, uh, an economy almost as large as the United States. In purchasing power parity, it's larger than the United States in terms of uh, conventional kind of uh, uh, currency, cur cur currency values. It's, it, it's, it's less than the United States. But about a third of the world's growth after 2007, 2008 was coming from China and from China alone. So that China was definitely actually very active in overcoming the crisis of 2007, 2008. And all I said in 2007, 2008 was, we have to look at this kind of shifting hegemony. And I used a language about, you know, tectonic shifts in power structures in the global economy uh, of this sort. So, and, and I was kind of saying we have to understand the uneven geographical development of capitalism, uh, the, the slackening off of the power of the United States after the uh, 1990s onwards, and, and the growth of Chinese, Chinese power as being very significant. And, and it was intriguing to me uh, that it wasn't only Chinese power, it was also Chinese power relative to the other holders of the major U.S. debt. U.S. treasuries were very much owned by foreign governments. China was a major owner of treasuries. Russia was a major owner of treasuries. And Japan was a major owner of U.S. treasuries. So they were the ones who actually held the U.S. debt. The U.S. was heavily invo involved in the debt. And I pointed this out and said, well, you know, this creates a very, very complicated situation. And I came across a, a well-authenticated account, which struck me as a very, very in intriguing, that in 2008, one of the institutions, a set of institutions that went close to belly up in the United States, were the, the housing finance institutions, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Very, very large institutions. They were technically private, but everybody understood them to be actually backed up by state power and that the state was going to bail them out if necessary. So, so uh, the, these two institutions, nobody knew exactly what to do with the fact that they were holding a mass of mortgages, which were supposedly valued of, uh, you know, by X, as X trillion dollars, but the market value was kind of almost nothing. So what was going to happen to these two financial giants? And who held the stock of these two financial giants? Well, apparently... Uh, two of the major stockholders in, in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mae, Mac were the Chinese government and the Russian government. And the Russians apparently in 2008 approached the Chinese and said, hey, how about we just uh, 
crash all of our, you know, dump all, all, all of our stock in these institutions. And this will create a crash in the market and it will be seriously embarrassing to the United States. And so the, the Russians were proposing to the Chinese that they jointly do this action against the U.S. finance and U.S. financial institutions. And in fact, uh, so crash Freddie Murray, Freddie Mac, but it will put the United States government in very, very, very deep trouble. So, so, so the Russians were proposing that. The Chinese refused. And for an obvious reason, the Chinese needed the U.S. market to revive. The crash of the U.S. consumer market was having a dire effect upon Chinese industry. Chinese exports to the United States collapsed to about one third of their previous levels because of the uh, crisis in the United States. And the, United, and, and the Chinese had nothing to gain by crashing the U.S. economy even further, so that even the third of the consumer market that the, the Chinese were still working with uh, would disappear. Russia, on the other hand, had none of those problems. It was not actually selling to the, the U.S. market very much, and so it didn't have to look to a revival of the U.S. market. So the Chinese basically re rebuffed the, 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 the Russian, uh, Russian proposal. But I, I mentioned this just to give you an idea of the sorts of games that were being played around this financialization. So I had, I had two uh, problems with the way in which uh, the U.S. was coming out of 2007, 2008. First, I did not think that this, uh, uh, the stimulus was big enough. It was uh, something like $600 billion, and it would probably have taken two or three trillion dollars uh, to, to do it. And I've noticed this time around the stimulus, which has been set by the Biden administration, has been very much colored by this idea that they didn't make a big enough stimulus uh, package uh, back in 2008, and in fact they should have should have should have done, but they but but they didn't, and so one of the reasons why we've seen these two trillion and three trillion dollar packages coming out of the Biden administration has been the recognition that that is what it should have been done back in, in 2007, 2008. So part of my argument was that, and partly also I was saying that even that would be difficult because that would mean the, the U.S. would have to go into greater and greater debt, and its, its debt holdings were by, you know, largely from China, Russia, Japan, and 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 a few others, and this was making the U.S. in a sense, in a sense vulnerable uh, to what uh, its its creditors might uh, demand of it, and that there's a certain power which resides with uh, uh, creditors over debtors, and the U.S. as a as a major debtor during that period was therefore vulnerable in some way. So, now, so that was part of uh, my argument, which. Uh, uh, DeLong didn't agree with uh, at all. The second argument was, look, we have to understand the geography of all of this and the way in which, uh, you know, these shifts in hegemonic power are occurring, the rise of China, uh, the, the emergence of, of East Asia as a central configuration. And I started to use this language, which uh, was actually uh, used in the, in the National Intelligence Report in the United States, which was to say, that wealth is gradually accumulating in East Asia. It used to be that we extracted wealth from East Asia. We're now actually conceding wealth to East Asia. East Asia understood as a totality of what was going on in the region, which would include increasingly, of course, China as a major anchor. But then going alongside of it, Japan, which was, uh, you know, fourth or fifth largest economy in the world, uh, and South Korea, which had become a major economy, and uh, Taiwan, which was a major economy, and of course, uh, to some degree, Singapore. So if you put all of the, if you like, all of that together, you would say, well, maybe that's, that, that's the configuration of the new hegemonic configuration. It's not going to be one single state. It's going to be a collection of states. And what's so interesting about thinking of it in those terms was there was very close coordination going on between the East Asian economies. On the one hand, politically, and, and, and that they were very nationalist and very antagonistic to each other. So they had, if you like, a political antagonism uh, about who was top dog and who was not, and they were playing games with each other and were not at all friendly with each other. But when it came to economic coordination, they were actually rather, rather together. And when China started to set up this East Asian Development Bank as, an, as a rival to the International Monetary Fund, uh, there was some real, real heft in in in, in that uh, decision. That was the kind of thing that got the U.S. very, very, very nervous and very bad.
So uh, all I was kind of saying was we should really look at look at this and 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 the like. Well, uh, Brad DeLong didn't like this at all, um, uh, and I I, I I I shouldn't probably do this, but I got to do it because it's rather I, I I find it rather rather amusing, but. Well, he he read my my piece and then he he, he says he says uh, uh, the following he says um, after ten extremely dense paragraphs of what can I call it I can't call what David Harvey does pointless intellectual intellectual masturbation because what David Harvey does does not feel good at all and then he goes on to say. Uh, that uh, um, a little bit further further on in, in his commentary, he says this. He says, if we forced Harvey to turn his um into an argument, we would see that the argument he would be making does not hold together. But of course, we cannot say that Harvey's argument does not hold together because he does not make one. He doesn't understand Keynes, probably never read Hicks, does not understand Friedman, and I'm sure has never heard of Patinkin or Tobin or Modigliani. Yet somehow he thinks he has a standing to make judgments as to the likely success of Keynesian policy moves. Actually, he goes on to say, Harvey can and does say any damned foolish thing he pleases. The proper form of the argue, his argument is this. If we assume that Harvey, Harvey intends to make any sense, he must be attempting to say and then reconstruct something out of the rubble of what he's talking about. This was not a very complimentary uh, comment. I, re I replied to it by saying I don't see why I should read Hicks rather than Joan Robinson or Galbraith. And in any case, I was largely riffing off uh, uh, Arrighi and uh, Brodel, uh, which I suspect uh, uh, this guy is not uh, familiar with. Um, so here, here, here's the situation. So I then kind of thought to myself, I'm going to do something that I, I would very rarely ever want to do. And I checked here how, how he's doing in terms of uh, uh, citations in, uh, in, in, in Google's, Google Citation Index. And he has 16,586 citations and over his lifetime. Uh, I have 306,782 citations over my lifetime, which is very close to that of Paul Krugman, who has 366,000. So, you know, after all, let's take, let's take it that uh, at least some people are making sense of what I'm doing and, uh, and, and understood what I was doing and thought it was an interesting uh, question to pose. Uh, but uh, I was not neoclassical enough, and the neoclassicals are simply so. I suspect that uh, what we're going to get from uh, uh, this argument by Brad DeLong is, is uh, an, an attempt to reconstruct uh, the details of what happened from 1870 to 2010, concentrating on these two periods in which there was uh, a radical redistribution of wealth, uh, the creation of a middle class, uh, the, go, the movement away from a society which was 10% at the top of the 90% going to the rest to a society that was 10% at the top, 40% in the middle, and 50% in the base, and maybe even in some instances, depending upon you where, where you were, the base, would, the base would be even smaller, so that w what we have is actually a, a, a revolution in the distribution of income, uh, and the distribution of wealth and, and, and power. Uh, and, and his, uh, according to Krugman, his argument is that we have to explain where uh, this technological dynamism is coming from. And he apparently has uh, three uh, particular explanations, well, three bullets, if you were, which are part and parcel of the uh, situation. And the first, uh, is the rise of the corporation. Now, uh, to me, yes, the rise of the corporation is important in, in the totality of the story we'd want to tell, and it'd be very difficult to tell 
on that story without actually looking at the conversion from household capitalist economies uh, to joint stock companies and to a massive contemporary corporations. Yes, indeed, the centralization of capital that's going on and all those sorts of things is a terribly important theme, and it's one which I've referred to and would want to refer to again. So the corporation has a role to play. But to say that it's the role is stretching it a bit, more than a bit, in my view. The second feature was the rise of research institutes. Now, this is something which I think is very important, but I would put it in a different term. First off, it is clear that uh, the corporations organized research units to try to improve their product and to, to improve their competitive situation. And, and uh, things like uh, Bell Laboratories and so on were the sorts of things which we're talking about. Uh, and, and that was critically important. My own view is that that was, yes, that was part of the story, but it, was, it should be embedded in two issues. One is, where is the research occurring, which is going to produce the new forms? And a lot of it is occurring in the research institutes and the research universities. And the United States, with its research, institute, its research universities, played a cru crucial role. This is with the MITs, the, the, the Stanfords, the Caltechs, um, even Carnegie Mellon and, 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 and so on. These, 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 uh, uh, the research universities in the United States played a very, very critical role, particularly after, 19, uh, after 1945. And really the research universities in the United States gave the United States unparalleled advantages over the rest of the world. And one of the reasons why the United States managed to maintain its hegemony in the way it did was through the research universities. And by the way, the research universities weren't simply uh, accumulating uh, local research talent. The great thing about the research universities was they basically set out conditions of employment uh, to attract people from all over the world. So when you go to any of these labs, you'll find Italian, you'll find German, you'll find British, you'll find other scientists, people, all of the, the talent of the world, in a sense, uh, gets gets caught up in being drawn to MIT, drawn to Carnegie Mellon, drawn, drawn to, to Caltech, and so on. And so that if there is a res powerful research unit, for example, the British had a very, very good uh, uh, quantum computing unit, and it was taken lop, stock, and barrel and brought to the United, to the United States, given much more favorable terms, much more favorable salaries, much more favorable funding, and, 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 and the like, so that quantum computing came to the United States that way. Uh, after World War II, the United States took all the rocket scientists from Germany and brought them in. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, a lot of the Russian scientists who were working on space programs and the like were also brought to the United States. So the United States, through its uh, import of uh, talented uh, labor, through the creation of research universities and the like, has has been been a major force in terms of technological innovation. And this actually comes back to something which I do take from Marx very seriously, which is that Marx kind of argues that technological change largely comes from the coercive laws of competition, forcing capitalists or states to seek out the most advantageous forms of production. And in the case of states, of course, it's the most advantageous forms of military equipment and military research and the like. So the competitive, the, what, what, what lies behind this is to me the, 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 the coercive laws of competition, which are forcing technological change and pushing it very hard and through institutions and the formation of the, of, of the corporate universe, uh, university and the corporate uh, a corporation, so we start to see uh, the, 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 the fantastic kind of uh, technological innovation which starts to come on board after after 1860 or so, and which then governs this whole period that uh, Brad DeLong is talking about. But the key thing here is to say there was a moment, and Marx records this, when technology became a business, when you no longer innovated to improve your own structure. Of, of production. You innovated to actually come up with generic technologies which was going to change the systems of production everywhere, which is, of course, 
what computer logic does, what, or, or what um, robotization does, and so on. You can apply it to almost almost everything. So, this is this is this is indeed a very important part, uh, story to be told here. But it has to be uh, embedded in the notion of the totality. So that while Brad, Brad DeLong kind of says, well, it was just research institutes for the corporations. No, it wasn't. It was this whole kind of emphasis upon technology through the unleashing of the technological, uh, 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 the, the coercive laws of competition uh, and the way in which relative surplus value, Marx's key category, uh, becomes a, a, a business opportunity in itself in which the business of technological change uh, start, starts to become Critical, and that business, of course, allows allows for the recuperation of some of the benefits of technological change through licensing and and, and all the rest of it. Now, the third thing that uh, Brad DeLong talks about is globalization. Um, I take globalization to be an effect rather than a cause. Globalization is an effect of the rising mass of surplus which is being produced. It becomes necessary to absorb the surplus that you go global. Yes, you go global. In order to go global, you have to establish uh, a rules-based international order, which is what the leading hegemonic power at the time, the United States, does. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, Braudel's argument that uh, hegemony lay with the United States, well, he didn't make this argument about the United States, but what you would, following Braudel's argument, make the argument that the United States became hegemonic. It became hegemonic, it became the center of technological dynamism. It became uh, the, the, the powerhouse in the global economy. Uh, it became actually the, 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 the power that structured uh, a form of international order that was advantageous to the United States. And the case is that uh, free trade is, uh, of course, uh, established by that rules-based order, and it's a rules-based order which is advantageous to the United States. And that free trade, of course, is something which is established uh, after the break with the Bretton Woods system in, 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 in uh, sort of... Uh, uh, August 15th, uh, 1971, when the U.S. went off the gold standard. So here you have, here you have, a, I think, an interesting kind of set of questions. And these questions are, uh, therefore, significant to look at. And I'd be very anxious to see the book when it comes out. And, and, and I'll probably write a review of it, which will annoy him. Uh, Brad DeLong, uh, no end. There was, uh, if you care to follow up the debate uh, between Brad DeLong and myself, uh, you can do it on the web. It's kind of uh, uh, entertaining uh, and uh, in the sense that uh, he uses almost every rude word he can possibly find. Uh, and uh, and, and, and I, 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 I sort of find it amusing. And there are a lot of people who kind of piled in on the debate so you can... Uh, see see what was what was said, but one of the themes that I took up in my uh, in my uh, response was to talk about the arrogance of the economists. The economists kind of think that I mean, when 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 Matt DeLong kind of says, "Well, you know, I don't understand Friedman, I don't understand Keynes, I don't understand this," you know, I could well say to him, "He doesn't understand Marx, he doesn't understand uh, Braudel, he doesn't understand uh, Rigi." Uh, and in any case, there are economists around like uh, Piero Schraffer and so on who are kind of uh, very undermining of everything that Brad DeLong is, is, is uh, concerned with. So he's, he's a, a typical kind of uh, hatchet man, if you like, of the economists and, uh, and, and, and specializes in being extremely rude and getting away with it. But uh, like I say, I don't uh, find his... his, his uh, the, the the story that has been t told by by Krugman as being the interesting story, I don't find that uh, terribly convincing in terms of understanding where uh, where the you know where the innovation was coming from, what it was about, and I, I would argue that by reading the first uh, part of uh, Volume One of Capital, the theory of relative surplus value, you get a very very good understanding. Of where technological change comes from, and in the Grundry, so you understand something about what happens when technological change itself becomes a commodity, becomes a, a business, and where research institutes and so on can actually look to make money out of the licensing of their of their uh, of their uh, 
capacities and the licensing of their goods and and and, and so on. So this is something which uh, I think we're going to look at again, and I'd be very interested, like I say, waiting for the the book to come out because then I'll have much more to to say about it. And since I I owe him one, as we say in the business, I shall enjoy uh, doing a, a thorough review uh, of it. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.